Okay, everything that I'm going to say today is uh, joined with uh, Jean Bouzy and uh, Sylvain Corvizier. And in fact, this talk is going to be a direct continuation of uh, Sylvain's talk uh, on Monday, although I promise to keep it uh, self-contained as much as I can. So let me remind you that uh, on Monday, uh, Sylvain introduced a new property of uh, diffeomorphisms, which we call strong positive recurrence. And the main result in his talk was that this property is very, very common. Uh, many diffeomorphisms uh, have it in particular, every uh, C infinity diffeomorphism in dimension two with positive entropy has this property. Now, I will remind you what this property is uh, later on, but I prefer to do it later rather than now. Uh, what I'm going uh, to do in, in today's talk is to finish the story and discuss uh, some consequences uh, of this property. <laughs> so two of these consequences Sylvan uh, mentioned in his talk, uh, exponential decay of correlations and the central limit theorem for the measure of maximal entropy. What's going to be behind these properties is spectral gap uh, on some uh, Banach space, and I will explain uh, what this is uh, uh, later. Okay, so since we are talking about uh, measures of maximal entropy, let me uh, just give you a brief background on what's known about them for surface diffeomorphisms. So suppose we have a diffeomorphism uh, acting on a smooth compact uh, surface, and let's assume that the uh, topological entropy is positive. So the starting point is a theorem by uh, Sheldon Newhouse, which says that uh, a measure of maximal entropy always exists. Uh, this, is, this is a remarkable result because if you think about it, absolutely continuous invariant densities don't always exist. Usually they don't exist. And uh, even SRB measures don't always exist. But measures of maximal entropy do always exist. And in dimension two, they are also canonical in some sense. Uh, the number of uh, ergodic measures of maximal entropy is always finite. And uh, if you restrict to a homoclinic class, or if you assume that the diffeomorphism is topologically transitive, then the measure of maximal entropy uh, is in fact unique. So uh, in some sense, these are canonical uh, objects. Uh, we understand the, the structure, the ergodic theoretic structure of these measures uh, completely. Every ergodic measure of maximal entropy is uh, measured theoretically isomorphic to the direct product of a Bernoulli scheme and a permutation on finitely many points. So the measure is not always mixing, but you know, you can always you can always raise the, the diffeomorphism to a power P, and then the ergodic component with respect to the power are going to be uh, mixing, even, even uh, Bernoulli. Uh, now, everything that I'm going to say today makes sense when you uh, localize the diffeomorphism to a homoclinic class, but sometimes I'm going to be a little bit lazy and uh, not say that. So if you want, you can just uh, assume from the beginning that the diffeomorphism is topologically mixing and then, uh, then there is no, no issue. If you don't like the assumption that the diffeomorphism is topologically mixing, and indeed you should not like it because it's very rare, then you can just think about the restriction of the diffeomorphism to a, to a homoclinic class and everything will work, uh, will work fine. Okay, so uh, here are the, here's the formal statement of uh, uh, the results. Uh, let's begin with exponential decay of correlations. So uh, the theorem is that uh, suppose you have a, a infinitely differentiable diffeomorphism on a compact smooth surface with positive topological entropy. And let's fix an ergodic uh, measure of maximal entropy. Well, it's isomorphic to a Bernoulli times a permutation of P, uh, uh, P points. So let's call this P the period, okay? And the statement is that you can always uh, uh, bound the uh, covariance of two Helder continuous functions, phi and psi, uh, by an exponentially decaying uh, quantity. Uh, the coefficients here, the norms are the Helder norms. So it's, it's what's, uh, uh, what's written here. And uh, the constant C and the uh, uh, constant theta between zero and one depends on the Helder exponent. But uh, the point here is that, is that you have uh, exponential decay of correlations. Uh, why do I have the P here in the integrand to deal with the period of the measure, the non-mixing of the measure? If, if, if you do the spectral decomposition and pass to a topologically mixing uh, component by passing to a suitable power, you have normal uh, exponential decay of correlations. Okay, here is another result, the central limit theorem. So again, let's assume that we have an ergodic measure of maximal entropy for a C infinity surface diffeomorphism with positive topological entropy. Then the theorem says that uh, whenever you have a Helder continuous function psi, with, uh, which is centered, has integral zero with respect to the MME. And let's also assume that uh, the observable is not a co-boundary, almost surely. 
then you have the central limit theorem, which means that if you look at the Birkhoff sums of the function and you normalize by the number of terms, then you get, uh, sorry, you normalize by the square root, the square root of the number of terms, then what you get is a fluctuating quantity and the distributions of this quantity with respect to the measure of maximal entropy converge to a Gaussian distribution. This Gaussian distribution has a characteristic uh, width, which is called asymptotic standard deviation. It's sigma here, it's a positive number. And uh, it has formulas. Uh, these formulas, uh, first formula, it's, uh, it's called sometimes the green kubo identity, says that the asymptotic uh, variance uh, is the variance of the summon, that's the variance of psi, plus a correction. Uh, the correction is something that takes into account the dependence between the different summons, okay? If these were IIDs, then the classical CLT would say that the variance of the limiting Gaussian distribution is just the variance of the terms, but these are not IIDs. There is some dependence between them, so there is a correction. So this is the this term, which is the correction, the green kubo correction, and it converges because of exponential decay of correlations. Another identity for the asymptotic variance uh, comes from uh, thermodynamics. It's called uh, the linear, linear response formula. And it expresses the asymptotic variance as the second derivative of some thermodynamic potential. In uh, statistical mechanics, this thermodynamic potential is called minus the free energy. In dynamics, it's called the topological pressure. Okay, so these two theorems, you know, the exponential decay of correlations here, that the, co that the covariances decay exponentially fast, and the CLT with these identities for the uh, asymptotic variance. Well, the consequences are familiar. I mean, these things have been known for a lot of diffeomorphisms for many, many years. They were proved by uh, uh, many people, Ruel, Parian and Polycott, Givarsh and Hardy, Rousseau, Hegel. Uh, but what's, what's new in these results is not so much the consequences. What's new in these results is the assumptions. So the assumptions are only uh, infinitely many derivatives and dimension two, okay? We are not assuming uh, an also, we are not assuming axiom A, we are not assuming dominated splitting. We are only assuming infinitely many derivatives uh, and the uh, dimension two and the uh, assumption of chaos here is positive topological entropy. Only one, one, one small question. So the period P has no influence in this business. Okay, so the period P has influence in the decay of correlations because you have to work with the mm -hmm. sure. suitable powers. Uh, but for the central limit theorem, because you take sums, uh, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, you're asking because of uh, your result with uh, your wonderful result with Kanigovsky and Dolgopiat. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, how do you prove uh, these things? Uh, so, that's what I want to, to explain in this talk. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to do reverse engineering. Okay. So, we know uh, what we want to. Uh, to prove, and we are going to ask step by step, uh, what do we need to do to get it, okay? So anybody that has worked with the stochastic properties of dynamical systems will tell you that if you want to prove exponential decay of correlations and central limit theorem and linear response formula and local limit theorems and equidistribution of the periodic orbits with rates and neuromorphic extension of zeta funds and all this stuff, well, you had better uh, 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 find the Banach space on which the transfer operator of the measure acts with spectral gap, okay? What exactly do I mean by this? I will tell you in more detail uh, later. I just, want, I just want to say that once you have this, once you construct a Banach space on which the transfer operator of the measure of maximal entropy acts with spectral gap, then uh, techniques developed by many people over the, over the years, uh, uh, Deblin, Forte, La Sota York, Ruel, uh, Parian, Polycott, Givarsh, Givarsh and Hardy, Rousseau, Hegel, that's one person, uh, and other people uh, uh, will give you uh, these results using a collection of techniques that today is called the, the transfer operator method, okay? So this is really what we want to do. We want to construct uh, a Banach space on which the transfer operator uh, of the measure of maximal entropy acts with the spectral gap. And the question is how to do it. Okay, so uh, in, on Monday, uh, Sylvain uh, proved, that was the main result of his talk, that uh, subject to the assumptions of infinitely many derivatives in dimension two and positive topological entropy, you always have a, have a certain property, which he called strong positive recurrence. 
I will remind you what it is later, not now. Just remember that there is this property which holds whenever you have infinitely many derivatives and you are in dimension two. And what we're going to do today, today in this talk is just close the circle and explain a, a, how to derive the existence of a Banach space with spectral gap from this property. Okay, that's what I'm going to do uh, today. Okay, so in other words, on, on the technical level, what, what I'm going to discuss today is the following implication. The, uh, you assume that you have the strong positive recurrence property, which I will, I will remind you what it is later, but just remember that it holds whenever you have infinitely many derivatives and you are in dimension two. And we are going to deduce from it that there exists some countable Markov partition whose incidence matrix, which is an infinite matrix, acts with spectral gap on some nice Banach space of functions. And, and, and now I will uh, proceed to explain in more detail what I mean by this. First of all, since we're talking about countable Markov partitions and uh, we're going to use uh, symbolic dynamics, well, what else can I do? That's basically the only probably, thing I know. Probably, probably in the, yes. Probably in, in the last uh, slide, the implication is only in two dimensions or in general? Only in two dimensions. Only in two dimensions. Oh, oh, oh uh, sorry, sorry. No, here, here it's uh, general. Here, okay. it, here it's general. What is very specific to okay. Two dimensions is that this holds always. Okay, okay, okay. okay. You, I, no, no, but I, this, this is general. This is general. The implication is, is, is general. Okay. Yeah, yeah, this is general, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, let me start uh, fixing some terminology and notation. Uh, so the, our symbolic models are going to be countable Markov shifts. Uh, so uh, what's a countable Markov shift? Like a subshift of finite type with an infinite alphabet. In this talk, it will be convenient for me to think of countable Markov shifts as uh, constructed from graphs. So imagine that you have a, a countable directed graph with, on an infinite alphabet, and uh, then the countable Markov shift is going to be the collection of all two-sided paths on the graph. Or what is a path on a graph? It's a sequence of vertices which are connected by edges going in the right direction, okay? And this gives you a sequence of, of a, a collection of sequences which is of course invariant under the left shift. So there is also an action. The action is the action of the left shift, okay? And now it will be very convenient for me later to encode all the combinatorial information on the graph in terms of a matrix of zeros and ones. This is the transition matrix of the graph or the incidence matrix of the graph. And it's a matrix of zeros and ones. And you have one at entry A, B, if there is an edge from vertex A to vertex B. And there is zero at entry A, B, if there is no edge going from vertex A to vertex B. So for example, if you look at this graph, if you look at, an, at, a, at a vertex, there is no edge from the vertex to itself. So the principal diagonal is made of zeros. On the other hand, for every vertex A, there is an edge from A to A plus one, which gives you this of diagonal of ones. And there is all, also an edge from vertex A to vertex A minus one. This gives you this of diagonal of ones, okay? So we can, we can encode the combinatorial uh, structure of the graph in terms of a matrix of zeros and ones. Uh, and that will be very convenient for us. And now there is another piece of terminology that unfortunately I need to introduce. It, uh, it will appear in some of the results, but I don't want to pay too much attention to it. It's the set Sigma sharp. So Sigma sharp is a subset of the countable Markov shift, which consists of all paths which, uh, escape to which do not escape to infinity in the past or in the future. In other words, it's all the two-sided uh, sequences such that the positive half and the negative half uh, contain constant subsequences. Now, I I'd like you to think about this, this set, sigma sharp, as of a very, very big set because it contains the non-wandering set. So in particular, this set sigma sharp will have full measure for all invariant probability measures. So don't pay too much attention to the precise definition of sigma sharp. That's not going to be important for, for this talk. But whenever you see sigma sharp in the technical results which follow, just think of sigma sharp as a set of full measure for all shift invariant probability measures. And it is. Okay, so here is the coding result we are going uh, to use. Imagine that you have a C1 plus epsilon diffeomorphism with positive topological entropy. And let chi be some threshold of hyperbolicity. Then I proved in dimension two and the Sneer ben Ovadia proved in any dimension bigger than or equal to two, that uh, you can always find a countable Markov partition, which leads to a coding by the diffeomorphism by a countable Markov shift. So there is a coding map pi from the countable Markov shift 
to the manifold, which makes this diagram commute. And this coding map has two useful properties. The first is that it's finite to one on sigma sharp. So it's not finite to one everywhere, but it's finite to one almost everywhere because sigma sharp is a set of full measure for all measures, uh, invariant measures, okay? So it's a finite to one coding. Moreover, the image of the coding, while it's not necessarily the entire manifold, it does have full measure for every ergodic chi hyperbolic measure, for every ergodic invariant measure, which is hyperbolic of subtle type with a Lyapunov exponents either bigger than plus chi or smaller than negative chi. Now, why do I need these two properties? Basically, I need them to be able to move from measures above to measures below and back without changing the entropy. So in ergodic theory, when you have a factor map like here, which is finite to one, it preserves entropy. So every measure on the countable Markov shift will project to a measure below with the same entropy because it's finite to one. Also, if you have an ergodic chi hyperbolic measure below, you can always lift it to a shift invariant measure above with the same entropy, okay? So the ability to move to lift and the ability to project while preserving the entropy, you need finiteness to one to get it, okay? That's, that's why I'm emphasizing this uh, property. Now, I'd like to say that this result by now has been extended to many, many uh, other contexts, mostly by uh, Yuri Lima and the uh, collaborators, for example, with uh, Carlos Mateus. Uh, so they now have uh, coding results for certain maps with singularities, like billiard maps, uh, for non-invertible maps, uh, for three-dimensional flows. Uh, there are also improvements of these coding results. Uh, there is an important improvement by uh, Jerome Bouzy and Mike Boyle that gives you uh, not just finite one codings, but injective codings, almost sure injective codings. And another strengthening, which is actually going to be important to us uh, very soon, is that in, if instead of trying to code the, the manifold, the dynamics on the entire manifold, you, you just localize to a single homoclinic class, then you can make the countable Markov shift transitive, topologically transitive. Uh, let me say this again, if instead of trying to code the dynamics on the entire manifold, you try to just to look at what happens at the single homoclinic class, then you can make this countable Markov shift topologically transitive. And that's very important for the study of the measure of maximal entropy for reasons which I will explain uh, now. So here is our situation. We have, we have a dynamical system and it's coded by a countable Markov shift. And we have a way uh, of lifting hyperbolic measures up to shift invariant measures with the same entropy. And we have a way of projecting shift invariant measures to measures with the same entropy below. So what happens when you try to do it to the measure of maximal entropy below? Okay, and we lift it. So it has a lift to a, a shift invariant measure above. I claim that the lift is the measure of maximal entropy above. Why? Because had there been another measure above with bigger entropy, it would project to a measure with bigger entropy below. But we started with a measure of, with maximal entropy, so it doesn't exist. So it has to be that the measure above, that the lift of the measure of maximal entropy below, it must be the measure of maximal entropy above. Now assume that we have a transitive coding. Say we lifted what happened on a homoclinic class. Then the wonderful thing is that we have a formula for the measure of maximal entropy above. Now this formula was discovered by Bill Parry uh, uh, in the case of uh, finite alphabets and by Boris Gurevich in the case of countable alphabets. And he says the following thing, that if you have a transitive countable Markov shift with a measure of maximal entropy, then this measure of maximal entropy is a Markov measure. Moreover, they calculated the, the matrix of transition probabilities of this Markov measure. Now I'm not going to give you the formula because I don't, I don't need it, but I will say that the matrix of transition probabilities of this Markov measure is conjugate as a matrix, infinite matrix, to the transition matrix of the graph up to a constant, okay? So if we localize to a homoclinic class, or if we assume in advance that the, our diffeomorphism is topologically transitive, then the measure of maximum entropy above is coded by a Markov measure, and we know the matrix of transition probabilities. So we have a sort of formula for the Markov measure in symbolic coordinates, okay? And in this formula, the measure of maximum entropy is a Markov measure, and we even know what the matrix of transition probabilities uh, is. It's conjugated as a matrix to the transition matrix of the graph up to a constant, okay? So what all this means is that if you want to analyze the measure of maximum entropy of a diffeomorphism, it, it, it's, it's rather useful to code it 
uh, in terms of a, a, a countable Markov shift, because then uh, the coding of the measure of maximal entropy is going to be a Markov measure, and the transition matrix is going to be conjugate as a matrix to the transition matrix of the graph up to a constant. Now, I don't know if you took a class in Markov chains or not, but I'm sure that you will agree with me, you will believe me, that uh, all the information you need to know about the Markov measure to determine its behavior is the matrix of transition probabilities. It's all there, okay? So in particular, you can, you can translate the properties of the transition matrix to stochastic properties of the measure of maximal entropy. Okay, that's the way it works. So now you can ask me, okay, what do you need to know about the matrix uh, to get uh, exponential decay of correlations and CLT, okay? I'm doing reverse engineering. I know what I want to prove. I want to prove exponential decay of correlations. I'm trying to ask what do I need to show to be able to do it. So um, uh, I will construct a Markov coding and then I will get a description of the measure as a Markov chain. Now I'm asking what do I need to know about the transition matrix of this Markov chain to get exponential decay of correlations, okay? Uh, the answer is you need to know spectral gap. Okay, and now I'm going to tell you in more detail, maybe in too much detail, exactly what I mean by this. Uh, but I need to, to fix some notation before I do this, so let, so let me do this first. So suppose we have a countable Markov shift given by some uh, a graph, and I'm going to make my life easy now by assuming that all vertices have finite degrees. So from every vertex, there are only finitely many edges coming in and going out. This will be the case anyway for our codings, always. So I can, there's no harm in, in assuming this. Now let uh, T be the matrix of uh, the, the transition matrix. It's an infinite matrix, okay? I'm going to describe uh, 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 some linear algebraic uh, uh, properties of it, but I need to be careful because you know, an infinite matrix can act on many different uh, infinite dimensional linear spaces in different ways. So I need to tell you what is the action. Well, okay, so for our purposes, it's going to be convenient to look at the action of the matrix on the space of functions on one-sided paths. So you look at the space of one-sided paths, okay? This one-sided accountable Markov shift, and you look at all functions from this space to R, okay? And then the action of the transition matrix is going to be in terms of the Ruel operator. So you take a function whose argument is a one-sided sequence, and you sum it up over all pre-images. Because it's a one-sided shift, there are many pre-images, okay? I killed invertibility by looking at one-sided sequences. Where is the transition matrix? The transition matrix is what tells you what are the pre-images, okay? Now, just to understand what's going on here, imagine that you looked at the, in, at the invariant subspace of functions which depend only on the zeroth coordinate. That's like an infinite vector. Then you just get a multiplication of a matrix by a vector, by a column vector. Why is this well-defined? Because the degree is finite. So this, this sum is going to have only finite, finitely many terms, okay? But for the purpose of ergodic theory, it's convenient to work with the bigger space of functions on one-sided paths, rather than just look at the uh, operation of, of the matrix on infinite column vectors, okay? And now what is going to be the spectral gap property? Uh, roughly, there exists a subspace, which, is, which has a norm, which makes it into a very good Banach space on which you act with spectral gap. So now let me tell you exactly what this means. Okay, so what comes now is a little bit long and a little bit technical, so, but it's not very important. I just, I just want to show you that there is a, indeed a formal list of properties from a Banach space that we want to satisfy in order to be able to work. So basically what I want, I want to be able to construct a Banach space of one-sided functions, which I'm going to denote by curly L. And this Banach space, first of all, it needs to be big. So it needs to contain all the indicators of cylinders. Then the norm needs to be strong. So in particular, norm convergence in, my, in this Banach space should imply uniform convergence on partition sets, okay? Or on cylinders, it's the same thing. Then I want the action to be good. So first of all, I need this Banach space to be invariant under the action of the Ruel operator. And I also want the Ruel operator to be bounded in norm, okay? And here comes the spectral gap property, it's property four. It says that if you look at the spectrum of the operator, then it consists of a leading eigenvalue um, uh, equal to e to, the, e to the entropy. And the rest of the spectrum can be inscribed in a disk with strictly smaller radius, okay? And the spectral gap is the gap between the size of the leading eigenvalue and the radius of this circle which inscribes the uh, the, which, which contains in its interior 
the, the remainder of the spectrum. Okay, that spectral gap. The next three properties are me showing off. You can ignore it. Uh, I'm showing off by saying that, we, that the Banach spaces we are able to construct actually have some other properties which are very nice to have, make life very, very easy. Uh, uh, for example, you have the, the norm is a Banach algebra norm. The absolute value is a nonlinear contraction. And uh, multiplying by uh, general uh, bounded Helder functions preserves the space in a bounded way. Uh, now, now I'm not speaking to, to everybody. I'm just speaking to the people uh, in the know, so to speak. So to speak, what are these properties good for? They are good for analytic perturbation of twisted transfer operators. Uh, those that know what I mean will know why this is useful. Those that know, don't know what I mean, ignore it. Okay, I was just showing off. Anyway, so um, uh, bottom line of all this is that in order to prove all the nice stochastic properties of the, of the measure of maximal entropy, I want to prove what I would like to have, what I would like to do is to construct a Banach space of one-sided functions uh, on which the uh, transition matrix of the graph acts with spectral gap, where the action is the action of the word operator. And now the question is, well, when you look at the graphs coming from symbolic codings of diffeomorphisms, do they possess, do they possess such a Banach space or don't they possess such a Banach space? Well, let's start with the optimistic question. Does there always exist such a Banach space for any countable Markov shift? Okay, but the answer is no. The answer is that there are many countable Markov shifts for which you can construct a Banach space on which the transition matrix acts with spectral gap. But unfortunately, there are also many countable Markov shifts for which there is no such Banach space. Okay, so if this is the world of countable Markov shifts, then there are many famous special cases where you construct where you can construct such Banach spaces. The most famous example is a mixing subshift of finite type. Okay, uh, that's uh, the, the the space of Banach of uh, Helder continuous one-sided functions is like that. Has a norm which which uh, gives spectral gap. That's what Ruel's uh, thermodynamic formalism is based on. When you move to countable alphabets, and okay, now maybe not the measure of maximum entropy, but equilibrium measures, there is another very famous class of countable Markov shifts uh, uh, we equipped with equilibrium measures for which you can construct spaces with the spectral gap. These are the so-called Gibbs Markov uh, measures uh, and, and uh, shifts. And there are also other famous examples. Uh, for example, a young tower such that the height of the tower has a distribution which is exponentially decaying. That's another famous case when you can construct a Banach space with the uh, spectral gap, okay? So there are many cases where you can construct such spaces, but unfortunately there are also many cases when, when you know that you cannot. For example, if your countable Markov shift has no measure of maximum entropy, and the examples like this were constructed by Boris Gurevich, then you will never be able to construct a Banach space with the properties are listed above. There is also another class of countable Markov shifts, which I personally uh, am, am fascinated by. These are countable Markov shifts, which have measures of maximal entropy, but whose measures of maximal entropy satisfy uh, phase transitions of high, high order. Uh, the decay of correlations is polynomial, the CLT has abnormal normalization, or maybe the distribution limit theorem is not with a Gaussian limit, but with some stable limit. I don't know. You have all kinds of strange phenomena. These things can happen. And in such cases, you know a priori that you will never be able to construct a Banach space with the properties I listed before. So you have to ask what happens for the graphs which uh, um, exist for, which happens for symbolic uh, models. Yes. Um, in the previous picture, yeah. you seem to leave no blank space. Does your yeah. picture exhaust all possibilities? Yeah, either there is spectral gap or there is none. <laughs> but you seem to show Young Tower covering all spectral gap. Oh, that's not what I meant. Uh, that's not what I meant. I meant that I meant is as a point in the space of the rest of the other things. Although I have to tell you that in some sense, uh, it's not far from reality. Uh, but I don't want to get into the into it uh, now. It's uh, uh, it's it's much more than a point. Let's let's put it this way. But I need exactly to tell you what I mean by it's not all young towers. It's young towers where the tail of the height function behave well with respect to your measure. But we, maybe I'll get to that later. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. So 
since sometimes there are such spaces, such spaces and sometimes not, we have to ask what happens for the incidence matrices of the graphs which appear when you use an accountable Markov partition for a real diffeomorphism, okay? So let's ask the question on a general level. Suppose somebody gives you a countable Markov shift. How do you know whether there exists a Banach space with the properties I listed before or no? Well, what's nice is that, that, that this is completely understood on the level of abstract uh, countable Markov shifts. We have necessary and sufficient conditions on the shift uh, that decide, that tell us whether such a Banach space exists or not. Now, this, uh, these necessary and sufficient conditions are in terms of certain combinatorial properties, which I will now describe. So you take, you take, you fix a vertex A and you look at all loops of length N at the vertex A, or otherwise all paths from A to A of length N. Now let's count how many there are. Let's call the number ZN, okay? Now let's look at the subclass of first return loops of length N at the vertex A. So all paths from vertex A to A, which do not pass through A in the middle, okay? Now there is a very famous condition in the abstract theory of countable Markov shifts, which is this condition star here, which says that the exponential rate of growth of all loops is strictly bigger than the exponential rate of growth of first return loops, okay? There are exponentially more loops than first return loops, okay? This is condition star. It doesn't hold always, but it holds sometimes. It's a very famous condition in the abstract theory of countable Markov shifts and many, many different people arrived at this condition working on very different problems. So I believe that the first person to have used the condition equivalent to this is David Veer Jones. David Veer Jones uh, has a, a fantastic papers from the uh, early 60s or late 50s where he uh, extended the peron frobenius theorem to countable positive matrices. Okay, and he used a, a condition equivalent to this when he studied the rate of convergence. Uh, uh, Boris uh, Gurevich and Savchenko, much later, uh, arrived at this condition as a necessary and sufficient condition for the stability of the eigenvector problem for positive uh, uh, infinite matrices. Does the existence of a positive eigenvector, is it stable under perturbation of the entries of the matrix? They arrived at this condition. I arrived at this condition, again, in a different form. When I looked for, when I, when I investigated the question, when is the topological pressure real analytic for countable Markov shifts? And Sigvir Wert arrived at this condition when she studied what happens to the topological entropy of a countable Markov shift when you remove an edge. Does the entropy go down or not, okay? They all arrived at this, we all arrived at this condition from different directions. And believe it or not, this condition is also necessary and sufficient for the existence of a Banach space with spectral gap. Banach space with all the list of properties I listed before. The direction that this condition implies the existence of such a Banach space is in a paper by uh, Van Seer and me. And the direction that exponential decay of correlations on, on, on cylinders implies this condition is already in the paper of Will Jones from uh, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, yes, 60 years ago. Okay, so we have a necessary and sufficient condition. In other words, if we want to prove exponential decay of correlations for countable, for countable Markov, so for diffeomorphisms, what we should do is we should find a countable Markov partition whose uh, associated graph has this combinatorial property. There are exponentially more loops at a vertex A than first return loops, okay? And this is a necessary and sufficient condition. It's not a wasteful condition. If this condition doesn't hold, there's not going to be a Banach space with spectral gap, okay? So this is what we need to check. Unfortunately, this is not a condition that we can check. And the reason is that uh, uh, the, the results that we have, which give us the existence of countable Markov partitions, tell us nothing about the incidence matrix of this partition, okay? So we don't know what the graph is. We know that there is a graph, but we have absolutely no information on the combinatorial structure of the graph. And, in some, and the proofs give no hope of getting such information. So, so we are sort of stuck. I mean, how, how are we going to check a combinatorial property of a graph if we don't know the graph? So very luckily, there is another necessary and sufficient condition for this combinatorial condition, which is in terms of entropy. This is very good because I remind you that in our symbolic dynamics, we have an easy way of moving from results on entropy of 
measures on symbolic space to results on entropy of measures on, on the manifold because our coding preserves entropy, it's finite to one. So if the fact that we have a, a characterization of this condition star in terms of entropy gives us hope of translating this condition to a condition on the manifold and then attacking the condition on the manifold using the methods of smooth dynamics. So this is what we are going to do, okay? So let me now, but before we do that, let me explain to you what is this entropic characterization of this condition star, this combinatorial condition on the transition matrix of the graph. So this condition was discovered by Sylvie Rouet, and this is a good opportunity to, to remember this uh, remarkable mathematician who very sadly uh, passed away uh, last year. And her condition is in terms of uh, escape to infinity. So let me ex explain to you what is escape to infinity. So um, uh, suppose we have a, a directed graph and we have uh, with finite degree at every vertex and we have the collection of paths on the graph. It's a collection of sequence where we can put the natural topology, you know, the relative product topology. Now I want to define escape to infinity on this graph, okay? So I'm going to do it by declaring that a certain collection of sets are bounded sets. And then I'm going to say that escape to infinity is leaving all these bounded sets. So the bounded sets I'm going to take are the pre-compact sets. Why not? Okay. So I'm going to say that the sequence of points escapes to infinity if it eventually leaves every pre-compact set. Okay. And I'm going to say that the sequence of measures escapes to infinity if most of the mass of these measures eventually leaves every bounded set. So in quantifiers, the condition is that for every epsilon positive, for every pre-compact set, which is measurable, eventually the measure of this pre-compact set is less than epsilon. So all but epsilon of the mass would be eventually outside my bounded set, for every bounded set, okay? For every pre-compact set. That's a notion of escape to infinity. So now here is, uh, here is the characterization of uh, the entropic characterization. Uh, first, uh, I remind you that the Gurevich entropy of a graph is the supremum of the metric entropies on the shift. And uh, Roet's characterization, which I should say uh, uses a, 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 a lemma due to Gurevich and Zargaryan, says that this combinatorial condition on the graph, that there are many more first return loops than, uh, sorry, sorry, I said it wrongly, that there are many more loops than first return loops, this condition is equivalent to the condition that the limb soup of the entropy of measures when the measures tend to infinity is strictly less than the Gurevich entropy, than the supremum of all metric entropies. Now let me say this again, okay? What is the limb soup of the <laughs> entropy when the, when the measure tends to infinity? So you look at all possible sequences of measures which escape to infinity in this sense. Most of the mass will eventually leave every pre-compact set, okay? So you take any sequence of measures that escape to infinity in this uh, sense, and you look at the limb soup of its entropies. You would like the result to be bounded away from the supremum of all metric entropies, okay? So we're going to call this, this quantity the entropy at infinity, okay? And we would like the entropy at infinity, which is a, a bound, on the limb soup of the metric entropies of all sequences of measures which escape to infinity in the sense that they have end, that most of their mass leaves every pre-compact set, we would like this quantity to be strictly smaller than the topological entropy, the Gurevich entropy, okay? And this turns out to be equivalent to condition star on the counts of the loops. And uh, as I mentioned before, this is equivalent to the existence of a Banach space on which the transition matrix acts with spectral gap. Okay, so the condition, the entropic characterization is in terms of entropy at infinity. And now I would like to tell you that this entropy at infinity seems like a very, very natural object. And it appears not only in many other works in dynamics, it even appears in works outside dynamics. Now let me mention some, uh, some, uh, some papers. Uh, this this uh, entropy at infinity plays a central role in a, in a remarkable paper by uh, uh, Jerome Bouzy and Sibir Wet which gives a necessary, sorry, a sufficient condition for the existence of measures of maximum entropy for uh, interval maps. And it appears in a wonderful uh, a recent series of papers by Godofredo Yomi, Mike Todd, and Anibal Velozzo on the defect in uh, upper semi-continuity of the entropy function on countable, countable Markov shifts with respect to the vague topology. And it appears in number theory. Uh, there, is a, there, there are many papers. The most famous one is by Einstein, Lindenstrauss, uh, Michel, and uh, Venkatesh 
on Duke's theorem in, in uh, number theory, which they, these authors uh, 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 prove and generalize studying the entropy at infinity uh, for the geodesic flow on the modular surface and on other homogeneous surfaces. And there, are, there is a wonderful recent preprint, you can find it on archive by uh, uh, some people, not all the names I'm sure how to pronounce correctly, uh, Guezel, Nu, I think, Shapira, Tapi, and Rikelme. And there, is, there are also other papers by uh, uh, Barbara Shapira, for, for instance, the paper with the uh, Pete, or P, I don't know how to say his, his name, last name, I'm sorry, where they use this condition in the study of geodesic flows on non-compact uh, a manifold with variable negative curvature, okay? Uh, there's also papers by Velozzo uh, on this topic. And, uh, okay, I have, to, I have to mention also, there's a remarkable uh, approach to non-uniform publicity using specification, weak specification properties. Now, these papers uh, by Klimenaga and Thompson and some other people, they don't mention entropy at infinity as such, however, they have a condition, a sufficient condition, which says that the complexity of obstructions is smaller than the full complexity of the system. It's, it's very similar in spirit to this, uh, to this condition. It's not unreasonable to think of the entropy at infinity as the complexity of bad things. And this basically says that the complexity of bad things is smaller than the full complexity of the system. So it's in the same, uh, on the moral level, it's, it's very similar, okay? Okay, so, so now let's, let's move back to, to diffeomorphisms and try to uh, interpret the, this necessary and sufficient condition uh, uh, for spectral gap on the symbolic model to a condition on the manifold that you can attack with smooth dynamical systems. Okay, so I need some abstract nonsense. I'm sorry about this, but th this is really necessary because I'm going to use a notion of escape to infinity on the manifold, which is not the one coming from the metric. Okay, with, from the Riemannian metric, it comes from something else. Okay, so how do you define uh, generally escape to infinity? Uh, you use something which is called bornology. So what is a bornology? Uh, bornology is a collection of sets which you call bounded sets. So this collection of sets should satisfy some axioms and, and the axioms are very natural. The first axiom is that the union of all bounded sets covers the space. And then the second axiom is that finite union of bounded sets is bounded. And then the third axiom is that the subset of a bounded set is bounded. And the fourth axiom is that every bounded set is inside some uh, bigger measurable bounded set. Okay, these are all natural, uh, uh, natural axioms. And once you have a collection of sets which satisfy these axioms, you can say that the sequence of measures escape to infinity if uh, most of its mass eventually leaves every bounded set. Okay, uh, you saw ex an example like this, if you take the countable Markov shift and you use the bornology of pre-compact sets, well, you arrive at the notion of escape to infinity I described before. And now let me show you a bornology which comes from Pessin theory, okay? A bornology which is natural for dynamics, okay? So you start with a, with a diffeomorphism, let's assume a surface diffeomorphism, and you pick two parameters, chi and epsilon. And now you look at, at, at the set of all Lyapunov regular points, with one Lyapunov exponent bigger than chi and one Lyapunov exponent smaller than negative chi, okay? What is Lyapunov regular? Means that it satisfies the, con the conclusions of a selected theorem, okay? So you look at all the set of points, all the points which satisfy the conclusion of a selected theorem, where one Lyapunov exponent is bigger than chi and one Lyapunov exponent is smaller than chi. But this is a horrible set with empty interior and uh, it's not compact, it's not, not nothing, but it's Borel, okay? That's something. And we can define a bornology on this set, which is the bond. You say that the set is bounded if it's contained in a Pessin set. Okay? Okay, to be more precise, I want to use only Pessin sets with fixed parameters chi and epsilon. Okay? Okay, so I have a, I have a crazy set, the set of points which are Lyapunov regular, which satisfy the selected theorem with this bound on Lyapunov exponents. And I want to define a collection of bounded sets on this set. And this will be the sets which are contained in Pessin sets. Okay. I'm sorry, what's, what's your definition of a Pessin set? Ah, very good. So here it is. Uh, so a Pessin set with parameters chi and epsilon is a, se is a set where you have uniform hyperbolicity, which is expressed in terms of these parameters. So first of all, chi is a uniform bound on the rate of decay uh, on the stable and unstable directions. So chi is the rate of decay. And epsilon is, is the rate by which things deteriorate when you, pass, when you move along the orbit. Okay, 
So you remember that the fundamental idea in passing theory is that uh, you have some, some hyperbolicity which is allowed to deteriorate along the orbit. So epsilon tells you how fast you deteriorate and chi tells you how fast you are hyperbolic. Okay? Answer. I, I don't see the face. I don't see... <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Thank okay. You. Good. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry. I, I, it's, I'm not used to Zoom talks. Okay. So, so we have a notion of passing sets. We have this crazy Borel set of Lyapunov regular orbits, and we define a bonology, subsets of passing sets, and that gives us a notion of escape to infinity, which of course dynamically, when is a sequence of initial conditions, when does it tend to infinity? When the quality of hyperbolicity deteriorates. Okay, the, it, it moves up the hierarchy of passing sets, okay, all the way so to infinity. It, B is any, any set contained in a passing set. That's it right. It doesn't have to be measurable or anything, yeah. That's okay. right, that's right. Yeah, because I want, I want every subset of a bounded set to be bounded. So it doesn't have to be measurable. Okay, thank you. It's just a nuisance of the, of the, of the terminology. Okay, so now finally, let me remind you what was the strong positive recurrence property in Sylvain's talk, okay? So here is what, how we defined it. There exists a, a chi such that for every epsilon, whenever you have a sequence of measures whose entropy tends to the full topological entropy, there is some passing set whose measure is bounded below. Again, whenever you have a sequence of measures whose entropy converges to the full topological entropy, there exists some passing set whose measure is bounded below. In other words, if you have a sequence of measures which Whose, whose entropy is tend to the full topological entropy, you do not escape to infinity. Okay? You do not escape to infinity. So if you play with the definitions, you see that another way of saying it is that the limb soup of the entropy, the, the entropy at infinity with respect to the bonology of passing sets is strictly smaller than the full topological entropy. That's equivalent. And what Sylvain proved in his talk is that whenever you have a C infinity surface diffeomorphism, the entropy at infinity is strictly smaller than the, than the topological entropy when convergence to infinity is understood in terms of passing, in terms of escaping passing sets. Okay, that was the main result in, in, in Sylvain's talk. Okay, so now we are in the following situation. On Monday, Sylvain showed you the following two things. He defined the SPR property, which in the terminology of today is the property that the limb soup at infinity is strictly smaller than the full topological entropy when you are using the notion of, of, of escape to infinity using the passing bonology, escaping passing sets. And he showed that this property always holds for C infinity diffeomorphisms. And today what I told you is that the general theory of countable Markov shifts says that if you have this property, but with respect to the bonology of pre-compact sets on the symbolic model, then you should be very happy because it means <laughs> that there exists a Banach space on which, on which the transition matrix acts with spectral gap. Okay? So now I think it should be clear to you what game we are going to try to play. We are going to say, let's look at the symbolic model of our dynamical system. We know that below we have, that the entropy at infinity is smaller than the full topological entropy with respect to the passing bonology. Let's lift, let's use this, this condition to get this condition on a symbolic model. Of course, the question is, are the bornologies compatible? Does the fact that the entropy at infinity with respect to the bornology of passing sets below, does it imply that the entropy at infinity on the symbolic model uh, is smaller than the full entropy when you use the bornology of pre-compact sets above? Okay, it's a question about compatibility of bonologies. Is the, is the bonology below, the passing bonology below, is it compatible with the natural bonology of pre-compact sets on the symbolic model? If it is, we, we are in good, good condition because we can deduce from the entropy at infinity condition below, the entropy at infinity condition above, and then we have a Banach space with spectral gap above, okay? So the answer is that, okay, it depends on your symbolic coding, okay? It depends on your symbolic coding. And, and the, the technical result is that you can get a symbolic coding where this, when the bonologies are compatible. That's if you want the technical lemma in this talk. Technical lemma says that you can construct a countable Markov partition whose associated symbolic coding have, has the finite one properties, which, which I explained before. It covers all hyperbolic uh, ergodic invariant measures as before, and the bonology of passing sets 
below lifts to the uh, into the bornology of pre-compact sets above. And this is enough to deduce that if you have a sequence of measures which converges to infinity above, the projections converge to infinity below. Okay, so this set theoretic implication will give you that. And once you have this, you can get the following uh, result, which is that if you have the strong positive recurrence if, uh, condition, then you can construct the accountable Markov partition, which induces a symbolic model with, with compatible bornology to the peasant bornology. And that will imply that the transition matrix of this symbolic coding acts with spectral gap on some Banach space of one-sided functions, okay? That follows from a compatibility of bonologies. I'm going to skip the proof because I'm getting nervous about time. I'm really nearly out of time. So, so basically what I told you up to this point is that the results in Sylvan, Sylvan's talk, infinitely many derivatives in dimension two, this implies the strong positive recurrence property, which is a condition on entropy at infinity with respect to the a peasant bonology, we can construct a countable Markov partition, which leads to a symbolic model where uh, the bonologies are compatible. So entropy at infinity here, a condition on entropy at infinity on the manifold implies a condition on entropy at infinity on the symbolic model. This by general results on countable Markov shifts implies the existence of a Banach space of one-sided functions on which the transition matrix acts with spectral gap. And now we are in a position to employ the transfer operator method to get uh, everything that you want on the measure of maximal entropy using the, the uh, results which already exist, okay, by, by, by other people whose names I mentioned. Okay, now I have a little bit minute, a uh, few minutes left. I'd like to, to comment on the converse statements because some of these theorems are, are almost if, if uh, necessary, they're, they're almost, uh, they almost have if and only if statements. Okay, here, here is a, an outline of the argument in both talks, Sylvan's talks, talk and my talk, okay? You start by assuming dimension two and infinitely many derivatives. And then the main technical result in Sylvan's talk, which so far I didn't touch on, was what he called the um, uh, entropy continuity of Lapinov exponents. That's the basis on which everything, everything works. And I remind you what it is. It's a property that says that if you yeah, have a sequence yeah. of measures whose metric yeah, entropies yeah. converge yeah. converges to the full topological entropy, then the Lyapunov exponents of the measures converge to the Lyapunov exponents of the measure of maximum entropy. Okay. Again, if you have a sequence of measures whose entropies converge to the full topological entropy, then the Lyapunov exponents of the measures converge to the Lyapunov exponents of the measure of maximum entropy. And then Sylvan explained why this property implies the strong positive recurrence property. Okay, but this is really, everything is based on this entropy continuity of Lapinov exponents. Now, today I try to explain to you why, because of general results in countable Markov shifts, the strong positive recurrence implies the existence of a Markov partition, the existence of a Markov, Markov coding with a spectral gap, such that the transition matrix has spectral gap. In fact, the Markov model that we get has another property, which I will mention soon, which implies the following result, continuity of exponents with rates. So notice what we have here. We started from a qualitative statement on continuity of Lyapunov exponents that was proved in Sylvan's talk, but it was qualitative. And then I, what I'm claiming now is that uh, because of spectral gap, it actually implies continuity with rates, meaning that it's not just that the uh, the Lyapunov exponents of mu n converge to the Lyapunov exponents of the MME, they even do it with a rate which is square root of the difference of the entropies. So it's strange, you know, we started with a qualitative statement and we deduce from it a stronger quantitative statement. But what I would like to emphasize now is that because a weak statement implies a strong statement, we close the circle. It, it, this implies this, but Obviously the bottom statement implies the, the, the top statement. So we get equivalences. In particular, we get that the strong positive recurrence property implies Markov, Markovian coding with spectral gap. It's if and only if in some sense, but I need another property of the coding. I'd like to tell you what it is. So 
here is the general statement. This is the end of the talk. Many of you are lost anyway, so I'm going to give you the general statement anyway. Uh, you have a CR surface diffeomorphism such that the topological entropy of the restriction to a homoclinic class is bounded by the Lipschitz constant of F divided by R. If R is infinity, this is zero, okay? And you stick a chi in between. Then the following statements are equivalent, strong positive recurrence on the homoclinic class, symbolic coding with spectral gap and some other properties, and continuity with rates. Now let's look at the properties of the symbolic coding. So I want there to exist a symbolic coding, which is finite to one, and which captures all ergodic invariant measures with the, which are hyperbolic and, and, and non-atomic. I want the coding to be transitive. I want the transition matrix to have spectral gap on some Banach space in the sense I mentioned before with all the properties I listed before. And the new property is this. I would like every point in my shift space to call the point with the well-defined oscillated directions. And I want the oscillated directions to depend in a holder continuous way on the sequence. So of course the oscillated uh, directions are not defined globally below, but I would like them, them to be defined on all the points which are coded. Moreover, I want them to depend holder continuously on the coding. And this property happens automatically uh, in the codings that we have, also in, in the Benovadia's uh, coding, okay? We get this for free in some sense. Once you have a symbolic coding like this, I claim that it implies con the continuity of Lyapunov exponents with rates. If you have a measure, an ergodic invariant measure mu, whose entropy is close to the full topological entropy, then its Lyapunov exponents is close to the Lyapunov exponents of the MME. How close? Like the square root of the difference. So I have one minute left. Let me tell you how you prove. <laughs> Huh? Someone, uh, is there a question? Sheldon, turn off your mic. Is oh, the mic oh, on? Never mind. Okay, so. I'm sorry, yeah. No, 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 no problem. No. Okay, so basically, um, I, I talked today about the implication one implies two, and Sylvain talked about the implication uh, three implies one. What remains is two implies three. So let me explain to you the proof of two implies three. It comes from a general result on countable Markov shifts, which was proved for subshifts of finite type by uh, Shirali Kadyrov. And in countable, countable alphabets, it was proved by uh, René Ruhr and uh, me. Uh, you can find it on archive. And it says the following thing. Suppose you have an irreducible, that means uh, transitive, topologically transitive countable Markov shift. Suppose it has finite topological entropy, finite Gorevich entropy, and it has a measure of maximal entropy, and it has spectral gap on some Banach space, okay? It satisfies this condition star. It, it, it's strongly positively recurrent. Then the statement is the following. If you have an invariant measure M, whose entropy is close to the entropy of the measure of maximum entropy, then the measure is close to the measure of maximum entropy. Close in what sense? In the sense that if you compare the two measures in terms of the integrals of some observable, the results are close. How close? Like the square root of the difference of the entropies. Okay, the observable need to be held or continuous. Well, let me say this again. If you have a measure whose entropy is close to the full topological entropy, then the measure has to be close to the measure of maximum entropy in the following sense. The integrals on observables, which are held or continuous are close. How close? Like square root of the difference of the entropies. Okay, this is sometimes called effective intrinsic ergodicity, the results of this type. Now, how do we get from this uh, bounds on Lyapunov exponents? Well, in dimension two, the Lyapunov exponent is the integral of the un uh, log of the unstable Jacobian. Well, that's not a Helder continuous function on the manifold. But because of the additional property I mentioned before of our codings, the dorsalitis directions of coded points depend in a Helder way on the <laughs> coding, the lift of the unstable Jacobian is Helder continuous on the shift. So we can just use this function in this inequality and we will get that the left-hand side is a difference of Lyapunov exponents and that will be the proof. Okay, so that's, uh, I'm out of time. So